Hello, AP Kim, and uh, welcome to the Chapter 15 PowerPoint for um, the Acid-Base Equilibria uh, Chapter. This is extension of Chapter 14, and it gets into uh, what happens when acids and bases mix together. So if Chapter 14 was about here's what you get with an acid, here's what you get with a base, this one is, here's what you get when you put acids and bases together. And um, once again, a lot of calculations of pH, a lot of ice tables, and so forth. So let's jump right in. Uh, we're going to look at an effect in chemistry called the common ion effect. When you have two chemicals mixed together and they share an, uh, the same ion, then that ion is going to affect both chemicals' equilibrium. Um, an example of this would be sodium fluoride and hydrofluoric acid. Now when sodium fluoride dissolves in water, it makes Na+, but more importantly, it makes the fluoride ion. When HF dissolves in water, it's a weak equilibrium, um, weak acid equilibrium, and it makes H plus and F minus. So here the common ion would be F minus. Both solutes, NaF and HF, both make the fluoride ion. So those solutes are going to affect each other's equilibrium. Uh, specifically, the sodium fluoride is going to affect the hydrofluoric acid equilibrium. According to Le Chatelier, if you add F minus from the NaF to the HF equilibrium, it's going to shift the equilibrium to the left. Of course, shifting the equilibrium to the left is going to lower the concentration of H+, and the pH is going to rise. Or another way of looking at it is HF is a weak acid, but F- is a conjugate base, and so you would not expect the addition of F- to have no effect on the pH. You would, in fact, in fact uh, expect it to raise the pH. So let's uh, look more closely at this equilibrium with interactive example 15.1. Uh, if you look back in chapter 14 at our, at our notes, we, uh, we actually did the, <coughs> excuse me, we did the um, uh, ice table for HF in water, and we found that one molar HF is uh, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2 uh, will be the H plus ion concentration, or that the percent ionization of HF is 2.7%. So now we're going to look at what would happen to the um, ionization of HF if we also added to the one molar HF one molar sodium fluoride. So now we're looking at a mixture of sodium fluoride, a salt containing the conjugate base of hydrofluoric acid, and hydrofluoric acid, so we're looking at this common ion effect. So now we have a more complicated um, major species combination. We've got HF, we've got F minus, we've got Na plus, but Na plus is never going to have any effect on anything, so you, you can ignore the Na plus. And we have water, so our important equilibrium here is the ionization of HF to produce H plus plus F minus. When we do our initials, yes, we put one molar for the HF, but on the other side, we also have one molar F minus due to the full dissociation of the sodium fluoride um, salt. So we have one, zero, and one. Now we still have to shift to the right because we don't have any H plus, so we have minus X plus X plus X. So we have one minus X, X, and one plus X for our equilibrium values. When we plug them into the Ka and neglect the plus and minus x on top and bottom, we get that x equals Ka, 7.2 times 10 to the minus 4. Or another way of looking at it is it is 0.072% ionized. So if we go back up to the top and we compare 0.072% ionized when there's the sodium fluoride mixed in compared to 2.7% ionized when there's no sodium fluoride mixed in, we see that yes, the fluoride ion does shift this equilibrium to the left and it's much less um, uh, uh, H plus ion. Now, this was would actually be an example of something we call a buffered solution. So a buffer in chemistry is a solution that resists a change in its pH. Uh, 
Uh, it doesn't want to change pH. And it's made by mixing a weak acid with a salt containing the conjugate base um, of that weak acid. So um, you can also get it by mixing a weak base with a salt. So something like HF and sodium fluoride, or maybe you want to do ammonia and ammonium chloride, which would be a weak base and a, a salt containing a, a conjugate acid of that weak base. But any combination of a weak conjugate acid base pair is going to resist pH because the weak acid is going to be available to neutralize any hydroxide ions added and the conjugate base being in solution is going to be available to neutralize added hydrogen ions. So you come into this uh, solution and you try to add some base or you try to add some acid and you find that um, you simply uh, um, are neutralized either direction you try to change the pH. So that's why we call it a buffered solution because it uh, it buffers change in the pH. So an example of this would be a buffer containing 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar sodium acetate. The sodium is no consequence, but the acetate ion, C2H3O2 minus, is the conjugate base of acetic acid. So we have equal molarities, 0.5 molar, of both of these solvents, solutes, and we're going to calculate the pH of the buffer. So it's going to be an ice table. So we, uh, we write out our um, e uh, equilibrium reaction. We do our initial change in equilibrium. We solve for x, and we get down here, and x equals Ka and 1.8 times 10 minus fifth. So very similar to the previous problem. And the pH is going to be 4.74. So the pH of this buffer uh, buffers don't necessarily have a pH of 7. The pH of this buffer is 4.74. Now notice if you have equal molarities of a weak acid and its conjugate base that your pH will equal pKa. It did so here. The pH was equal to the negative log of 1.8 times 10 minus 5th, the Ka of acetic acid. And back on the previous problem, the pH equaled the pKa of the, or that the Ka was X or that the pH would equal the pKa. Um, so when you are at the point in a buffer solution where you have equal amounts of weak acid and conjugate bases mixed together, 0.5 molar, 0.5 molar, 1 molar, 1 molar, as long as the molarity of your weak acid and your conjugate base are equal, your pH will be equal to your pKa or the negative log of the Ka of the weak acid. Now, we said that um, these buffered solutions resist change in pH, so let's illustrate that with um, uh, calculating the pH change when uh, 0.01 mole of solid sodium hydroxide would be added to a liter of this buffer solution. So we have our buffer solution. It's got 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar sodium acetate, and we are going to add 0.01 moles of solid sodium hydroxide to it. So let's look, first of all, before any reactions occur, what do we have? We have one, um, um, let's see, I think I've screwed up here. Let me take a break here and fix something. We have 0.5 moles, right, because we have 0.5 molar. I'm surprised I didn't catch that in my previous... Um, editing. Okay, let's get back into the presentation. We have 0.5 moles of acetic acid, 0.5 molar times 1 liter. We have 0.5 moles of acetate, 0.5 molar 1 liter. And we have 0.01 moles of hydroxide due to the dissolving of the solid sodium hydroxide. Now, we're going to assume that any acid or base um, is going to have a reaction that goes to completion. So my assumption here would be that the acetic acid would fully neutralize all of the added strong base or all of the added hydroxide to make water and acetate. This is not an equilibrium. This is a stoichiometry problem. We will react until the limiting reactant gets used up. 
Now, why do we assume that all acid-base neutralizations go to completion? Well, if you look at um, this uh, relationship here, HA plus OH minus, acetic acid plus OH minus, yields water plus A minus. Look at that reaction in the backwards direction. A minus, conjugate base plus water, makes hydroxide plus conjugate acid. That's the KB, except we've written it backwards, so the K is actually 1 over KB. Remember, KB's equilibrium constants for our weak, weak bases are small, so 1 over a small number is going to be a large number, and that means that we don't really need to do, when K is large, we don't really, really need to think of it as an equilibrium. So what we're going to use is um, the assumption that this goes to completion. Now, this is sort of like, I'm going to call these if um, uh, tables instead of ice tables because um, we're going to assume these go to completion instead of having an initial change in equilibrium. So if we look at these, we have 0.5 moles of acetic acid, 0.01 moles of the hydroxide, and 0.5 moles of acetate the reaction is going to go to completion and the limiting reactant is going to be hydroxide. So it's going to go to zero, which is going to bring the acetic acid down to 0.49 moles and the acetate up to 0.51 moles. Now those are the numbers I'm then going to plug into the equilibrium of acetic acid um, and acetate. So I'm going to go back to the Ka weak acid reaction, 0.49 for acetic acid, 0.51 for acetate, shift to the right, plug in my numbers, neglect my plus and minus x's, solve for the x, and instead of 1.8 times 10 minus fifth, this time x or h plus is gonna be 1.73 times 10 minus fifth. So my pH is gonna be 4.76. Now, we added uh, 0.01 moles of solid sodium hydroxide and the pH only went up from 4.74 4 to 4.76. If we had added that much hydroxide to a liter of pure water, the pH would have jumped from 7 to 12. Because 0.01 mole per liter is 1 times 10 minus 2. And that would be a pOH of 2 and a pH of 12. So the difference between adding 0.01 moles of solid sodium hydroxide to a liter of water, which is a pH difference of 5, compared to adding 0.01 moles of solid sodium hydroxide to this buffer solution, which only resulted in a pH change of 0.02. So you can see buffers can help hold pHs constant. So these buffer solution problems, as I think you've just seen, are really just weak acid, weak base problems. We find the initial molarities and set up an ice table. But before you can find the initial molarities, if a strong acid or base is added, you have to do stoichiometry first because strong acid is going to convert weak base uh, to the weak acid form and strong base is going to react with the weak acid to convert it to the weak base form. So first you do the stoichiometry to use up all of the strong acid or strong base added and convert back and forth between the weak acid and conjugate base. Then when you get the amount of weak acid and base in the mixture, then you can do the ice table for the weak acid problem. In a buffer, you're going to have mixtures of conjugate weak acids and bases. And um, those are going to be capable of neutralizing strong acid or strong base. Up, and up to the capacity of the buffer. Of course, if either one, the weak acid or its conjugate base, gets used up, then it's no longer going to have the ability to hold the pH constant. Now, if you want a shortcut for working weak acid, weak base um, uh, buffer problems, there is a formula for finding the pH of a buffer. Now remember, this formula should not be applied to a solution of just a weak acid or a solution of just a weak base. This is not some magic formula that means everything we've learned up till now we can just plug into this formula. This only works, I must say this as strongly as possible, this only works when you have a buffer solution.
you have to have an appreciable amount of weak base and strong and weak acid combination. But if you have that situation, if you have a weak acid mixed with its conjugate base, you can use this formula called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And it says the pH of your solution will be the pKa of the weak base plus the log of the molarity of the conjugate base divided by the conjugate acid, or in the case of um, doing this generically, the log of molarity of A minus over HA. Um, the, this particular formula is pretty easy to derive if you know how to do logs and, and um, work with the pKa expression, but Zumdahl does it on page 607. I'm not going to take the time to go in and derive this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but it's a very useful equation for finding pHs of buffers. So a buffer, if you look at how the formula works, the buffer is going to be pH equals pKa, and then if the concentration of the base and acid um, are equal, then you're taking the log of 1, so that's going to be 0, so the pH is going to equal pKa. So in a buffer, your pH starts out as pKa, and then if your concentration of weak acid, weak base um, are uh, different, then you have to adjust the pH a little bit up or a little bit down based on this log of A minus over HA uh, formula. Um, now, this means that you can buffer uh, a solution at a variety of pHs because you can have a variety of pKa's. If your Ka is 10 to the minus 2, you can make a, P a buffer that's got a pH of 2. If your, P if your Ka is 10 to the minus 8, you can get a buffer with a pH of 8. And so it gives um, a lot of possibilities for making buffers because different weak acids have different Ka values. But usually, with if you're making a buffer, you want to keep that base acid ratio as close to 1 as possible. Uh, yes, you can affect the pH by making that different than 1, but remember, you're going to sacrifice either having conjugate base ready to react or conjugate acid ready to react. You want um, both of those waiting in the wings ready to attack any um, strong acid or strong base added. You don't want to have a lot of conjugate base and very little weak acid because then you wouldn't be able to resist pH with an added base because your conjugate acid would run out quickly and so forth. Now if you have more concentrated values, as long as they're equal, your pH will equal pKa, but I'd rather have one molar A minus and HA than 0.1 molar A minus and HA or weak, weak base, weak acid. Uh, because that will give you uh, more stability in that ratio of uh, base over acid. So the idea of a buffer, pH equals pKa, there's a slight adjustment when base and acid don't equal 1, but you want to keep that base acid uh, ratio as close to 1 as possible to give you maximum buffering ability. Let's take a look at uh, finding the pH of a buffer. We have 0.75 molar lactic acid and 0.25 molar sodium lactate, lactate being the conjugate base of lactic acid. Um, we could set up an ice table and work it out with initial and uh, change in equilibrium or take the shortcut, pH equals pKa plus log of base over acid. And you see that using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is quite a bit faster. Um, so we have the negative log of Ka plus the log of 0.25 molar for the lactate ion, 0.75 molar for the lactic acid molecule, and so the pH equals 3.38. So you see that ice, uh, ice tables are one way of getting this answer, but it's much faster if you use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So here's a buffered solution with 0.25 molar ammonia and 0.4 molar ammonium, the conjugate acid of ammonia. We're trying to find the pH. Now let's use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but first let's calculate Ka. We have Kb, but we know Kw over Kb equals Ka. So Ka is 5.6 times 10 minus 11. Now we can plug into pH equals pKa plus log of base over acid the base being the 0.25 molar ammonia and the acid being the 0.40 molar ammonium. So this would be a buffer that 
would try to anchor the pH around 9.05. So let's go back and uh, look at um, this particular buffer um, ammonia and ammonium chloride. Previously we did uh, what would happen to the pH if you added a strong base. Let's take a look at adding a strong acid. Um, if we have 0.25 molar ammonia and 0.40 molar ammonium and we add 0.1 mole of gaseous hydrochloric acid, we can assume the H plus from the HCl will fully neutralize the NH3 until all the HCl is used up. So I'll do my little if instead of an ice table. When it's stoichiometry, I'm going to do an if table, initial and final, 0.1 moles of H plus from the dissolving of the gaseous hydrochloric acid, dissolving and then breaking into H plus and Cl minus, 0.25 for the ammonia, 0.4 for the ammonium. After the reaction is complete, because it's not in equilibrium, it lies far to the right, you're going to have 0 0.15 and 0.5. So now we're ready to plug in. Um, the Kb of ammonia is 1.8 times 10 minus 5th. The Ka of ammonium is 5.6 times 10 minus 10. I know it doesn't say that in the problem, but we've seen that seen those numbers a lot back in chapter 14. So uh, you can always go back and look those up. Ka's and Kb's are in tables back in the uh, previous chapter. But we, uh, anyway, we get pH equals negative log of Ka plus log of base over acid 0.15 over 0.5, and we get a 8.73. Now, um, if this had been uh, no HCl added, we saw it was 9.05. So it's dropped a bit, um, but it's still hanging around in that 9 range uh, for the pH. So it's, it's trying to buffer the solution and keep the pH constant. Not doing such a good job because notice you don't have as much base as you have acid there. This would have done a better job of buffering if we'd had more of an equal amount of ammonia and ammonium. And uh, larger numbers would have, would have uh, kept it uh, more constant. So we, we call the ability of an acid or base to hold the pH constant the buffering capacity. In other words, how many protons and how many hydroxides can this buffer solution absorb without seeing changes in the pH? So to illustrate that, let's, um, let's show um, a buffer um, with two different concentrations. It'll be a, let's go back to our buffer of acetic acid and acetate. And let's show the pH um, change when 5 molar acetic acid and 5 molar sodium acetate have 0.01 moles of um, uh, gaseous hydrochloric acid added. So in other words, we're adding acid to our buffer. Now, our second example is we're going to look at how 0.05 molar, which is 100th the molarity, and 0.05 molar sodium acetate, um, how well it will hold the pH constant. So um, looking at our if table first, um, we find that uh, to neutralize all the H plus brings the acetate ions molarity down to 4.99 and the acetic acid up to 5.01. When you plug those numbers into the panderson hasselbach equation, pH equals 4.74. That's the same pH we saw um, earlier when we had um, acetic acid with um, equal, where is it at? Yeah, see back here, acetic acid is 4.74. So the pH equals pKa when you have equal amounts of um, weak acid and weak base. And with uh, 5 and 5, we would have got 4.74. And you still get virtually 4.74. It really only changes in like the third sig fig um, when you add this much acid to it. But let's compare that to solution B. If we uh, do it with 0.05 molar acetate and 0.05 molar acetic acid, um, we see that the, um, the pH actually sl uh, slides down to, um, let's see here. How do I get that out of there? Wait for that thing to go away. 0.25. 
there it is, slides down to 4.57. So yes, that's still close to 4.74, but it did change a lot more because we didn't have the capacity to neutralize the added acid because we didn't have as much acetate available. We only had 0.05 moles instead of 5 moles. So it's all about trying to keep that ratio constant and the best way to keep that ratio constant is, keep, is to keep the numerator and denominator both large and close to equal. When they get small they're easy to, easier to change. So let's look at um, choosing the right acid for a buffer. So we have a chemist and they want a buffer that's 4.30 and they've got these four acids available with these different Ka values. And they're wanting to know how to get the right HA to A minus ratio to get this pH of 4.30. So um, for a pH of 4.30, they're looking for an H plus ion concentration of 5 times 10 minus 5th. I'm going to do something a little fancy with uh, my algebra here. K A equals H plus A minus over H A, or if you rearrange it, H plus over K A will equal H A over A minus. So we're looking what H A A minus ratio is needed to get the pH, the pH that you want. Um, and so um, we need an H A A minus uh, ratio of 5 times A minus 5th over um, K A because we're looking for a 5 times M minus 5th uh, molar H plus. So 5 times M minus 5th over the first K A 1.35 times M minus 3rd is 0.037. If I do the same math with the other three acids I get 3.8 and 0.78 and 14. So I'm going to say in this case that letter C would be your best choice for this buffer because it has the ratio of A minus and H A that is closest to 1. Now you have to adjust it a little bit to get it to be uh, exactly 4.30 for your pH, but it's pretty close to being a 1 to 1 ratio between the weak acid and the conjugate base. So this is a lesson. When choosing a buffer and you know what pH you want your buffer to be, look for an acid whose key Ka matches that. In other words, um, if you want a buffer to have a pH of 5, look for a Ka that's 10 to the minus 5. If you have a buffer and you want it to be 11, look for a Ka of 10 to the minus 11. All right, we're going to transition to, uh, now this seems like a, oh, we're totally changing directions, but in fact you're going to see uh, a lot of the algebra is still the same. But we're going to look at titrating um, acids and bases and plotting a pH curve as a function of how much base or acid you've added. Now quick definitions here. Um, titrand or analyte would be the term we would use to describe the unknown solution, uh, the one whose concentration is being determined. Titrant or standard solution would be the solution that you know the concentration of, the one you're using to find the concentration of the unknown. Now remember, we can assume if we're titrating an acid and a base with each other that the reactions are going to go to completion. And then after they've gone to completion, we're going to take what's left after the, the stoichiometry is done and figure out the pH based on the remaining species. Let's start uh, with a strong acid, strong base uh, titration. Let's assume we've got 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid in a flask and we are adding from a burette 0.1 molar NaOH. Now um, because that's a single acid and a single base you should assume that you're going to get to your end point on this titration at 50 milliliters of NaOH added. But let's take a look at what's happening to the pH as you get from 0 to 50. Um, your initial pH is just going to be the pH of the 0.1 molar HCl. You haven't added any base to it yet. So you're, you're looking at negative log of 0.1 or initial pH of 1. So on our curve or graph, our pH should start out at 1 when you've added 0 milliliters of base. If you add 10 milliliters of strong base, 
If you do the uh, moles of um, each one, you have 0 0.005 moles of H plus that you're adding to 0 0.001 moles of OH minus, which is going to bring your H plus down to 0 0.004 when you do the final moles. Now, um, that's 0 0.004 moles of H plus divided by 0 0.06 liters, not 0 0.05, but 0 0.06 because you've added 10 milliliters of base to 50 milliliters of acid. So don't forget to add your volumes um, as you do these titration problems. So that's a 0 0.0667 molar or a pH of 1.18. So notice you've, you've um, neutralized one-fifth of your acid, but your pH has only risen from 1 to 1.18. Now, um, without going through the math, let's take a look at some other um, amounts. If we add 20 milliliters of the base, it'll rise to 1.37. And then if we add 30 milliliters of base, it'll be 1.60. 40 milliliters of base, 1.95. 45 milliliters of base, 2.28. 49 milliliters of base, you finally got the pH up to 3. And by the time you get to 50 milliliters of base, you will have totally neutralized all the acid and all the base, and it'll be neutral. Um, and you'll have a pH of 7. Now, let's, um, let's not stop there. Let's keep going. What if we went past the endpoint? What would happen to the pH if we went past the endpoint? What if we got 10 milliliters of more base than acid? Well, in that case, I'm just going to use the unreacted sodium hydroxide to determine the pH. So that would be um, 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide would be unreacted, 50 milliliters would have reacted, and so from that I can do the total moles of OH- divided by the liters, and I get a pH of 11.96. If I add an extra 50 more than needed to titrate the HCl, so in other words, if I add 100 milliliters of base, the first 50 neutralize the, the acid, but I add 50 more beyond that, I would be at a pH of 12.52. And if I kept the graph going, even beyond there, you would see the pH getting closer and closer to 13. Or in other words, we start at a pH of 1, the pH of the acid. We end at a pH of 13, the pH of the base. This would be the shape of the graph. So this little S-curve here, um, this titration or pH curve, shows that um, the logarithmic nature of pH means that you really don't change from pH 1 to 2 until you've neutralized 90% of your acid. Remember, a pH of 2 has one-tenth the H plus concentration as um, a pH of 1, and a pH of 3 is one hundredth. And so you've got to be like 90% neutralized before the pH rises from two to th 1 to 2. Then you got to be like 99% neutralized before it gets to 3 and 99.9% .9 neutralized to get close to a pH of 4. But then once you reach the equivalence point and you no longer have any acid to neutralize the added base, the pH jumps up and begins to level off around a pH of 13. So it's real clear where you've added the right amount of base to neutralize this acid. It's where this pH shoots up. So this point on the graph, this inflection point, which would be the center of that vertical part, the inflection point, if you've ever heard of that term on graphs, described on, described on graphs, is what's considered the equivalence point, the point where you've added equal moles of acid and base. And you can use the stoichiometry to find the molarity of the unknown. So in this particular case, the inflection point uh, is centered right at a pH of 7. Because remember, strong acid and strong base neutralize to give neutral salts and water, or in other words, pH of 7. So the inflection point on the curve, the point where equal moles of acid and base have been added, um, signified by where that red line crosses the uh, blue graph, and notice a really large change in pH occurring at the inflection point. So remember how hard it was um, to get the right amount of base added to get that faint pink color we were looking for in our titration because we went from colorless to purple and it seemed like one drop. Well, you can see on the graph why that is. 
you, you go from an acid to a base with really just the addition of one drop. Now, how would this change if we were talking about a weak acid and strong base? Let's say I've got some vinegar, some acetic acid, and I'm titrating it with sodium hydroxide. This time we're using 0.1 molar and we've got 25 milliliters of our acid. Uh, you would actually, to start out your um, pH curve, you'd have to calculate the pH of pure acetic acid, which would take an ice table, and you'd come up with 0.1 molar acetic acid having a pH of 2.87. Then, if you added 10 milliliters, just under half the amount it needs to uh, neutralize this acid, uh, you would get um, that you would have 0 0.0015 moles of acetic acid that hadn't reacted yet, and you'd also have formed 0 0.001 moles of acetate. Now, we could set that into the ice table with acetic acid on one side and the acetate on the other and create an ice table and work it out, or we could recognize that this is in fact a weak acid combined with a conjugate base. I told you this stuff is like buffer problems because technically an unfully titrated, when you have a, uh, doing a titration and you've partially titrated a weak acid, you've created a buffer because you've converted your weak acid to its conjugate base and that means you have a mixture of the weak acid in its conjugate base. So I could set up an ice table, or I could just recognize this to be a buffer and throw it into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. After 10 milliliters of the base have been added, you'd be at a pH of 4.57. If you add 12 and a half milliliters of the base, which is enough to half neutralize it, you'll have a mixture of acetic acid and an equal amount of acetate. Half of your acetic acid has converted to acetate, so you have an equal number of moles of each, or in other words, pH equals pKa. We actually call this point on a titration curve the half equivalence point. When you've neutralized half of your acid and turned it into its conjugate base, you've reached a point on the graph where the pH should equal the pKa, or in the case of acetic acid, 4.74. Now, if you go beyond that to 20 milliliters of base, your pH is going to be 5.34. At 23 milliliters of base, you're looking at 5.80. And then at the addition of 25 milliliters of base, you no longer have a buffer solution. You cannot plug into the pH, uh, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, because at the point where you have used up all of your acetic acid, you no longer have a buffer situation. What you have is a conjugate base um, problem. You have converted all of your acid to its conjugate base. So at the equivalence point, you really don't have a pH of seven anymore, like you would for a strong acid, strong base. You have a pH that's based on the molarity of a weak acid, of a, of a um, weak base. So instead, and notice it's not 0.1 molar anymore. The 25 milliliters has become 50 milliliters of solution. So your 0.1 molar acetic acid has become 0.05 molar sodium acetate, which if you do a weak base and set up an ice table and do the KB, it ends up being a pH of 8.72. So notice the pH is not 7 at the equivalence point. If we go beyond the equivalence point, now we're going to be looking at the pH as being determined by the excess base sodium hydroxide. So this would be a little peek at what that would look like if you graphed it. Um, notice the pH starts out about 2.7, then it levels off, so it kind of rises a little bit at first, but then levels off, and it's leveling off because of that buffering ability you get um, when you have a mixture of a weak base and conjugate acid. And then notice the inflection point, or the, ver the middle of the vertical part of the graph, is actually above eight or right around eight for the pH instead of seven. Also notice we don't have as much vertical portion because we start out at a higher pH. We don't have that really tall vertical portion in the middle of where the inflection point is. We have a narrower band there. So notice buffering on the left side of the graph where it kind of levels off at the half equivalence point, the pH equals pKa. 
So that would be on this graph at 12.5, the pH equals 4.74, or the pKa, or the negative log of 1.8 times 10 minus fifth, the Ka of um, acetic acid. And the pH at the equivalence point is not 7, but above 7, and that's because you have converted acetic acid to its conjugate base, acetate, and acetate is a base, and it will raise the pH above 7. It's a weak base, but it is a base. The strength of your weak acid is going to have a big effect on the pH curve. Notice strong acid has a much taller portion here in the um, part where you're at the equivalence point, and then as your acid gets weaker and weaker, you get less of that vertical part where it's easy to tell where the uh, inflection point is. But in each case, at the half equivalence point, or halfway to the end point, you do have a pH equal pKa. So Ka equals 10 to the minus 2, pH equals 2 at 25 milliliters, or the half equivalence point. Ka equals 10 to the minus 4, um, they did not graph this very well, it should be right at 4 will be 25 milliliters, and 6 for Ka 10 to the minus 6, and 8 for Ka 10 to the minus 8, and 10 for Ka 10 to the minus 10. Now similarly, you could start with a base and neutralize it with a strong acid. That's another way of doing it. And in that case, uh, again, your um, pH will equal pKa at the half equivalence point. So at the half equivalence point, which is halfway to, the end, uh, to that inflection point or that vertical region of the graph, um, halfway there, you will see the pH is equal to the pKa, in this case, of ammonium, NH4+. Because half of your NH3 has been converted to NH4 plus, and an equal amount of NH4 plus and NH3 is a perfect buffer with equal molarities of weak acid and conjugate base. Okay, let's talk briefly about indicators because indicators are also part of doing a titration. Um, chemists really have two main tools that they can use for finding the pH of something. Um, there's the electronic technique that actually measures the conductivity of the solution to find out how many ions are in it and measure the amount of H+. Um, and that's called the pH meter approach. Um, and it, that's an electronic device. You can stick a probe in and get the, um, the pH using a pH meter. It's a digital output and everything. Or you can do it the, um, the more uh, uh, cheap way or... Um, poor man's way, which is to use uh, acid-base indicators. And these are chemicals that turn color at different pHs. Now, you might wonder, how can a chemical gauge the pH and know what color to change to? Well, it's actually quite simple. Indicators work because they are weak acids and their conjugate base pairs. When you're in the weak acid form, and that's going to happen at acidic pHs. Um, the molecule has one color, but when it loses H plus and becomes its conjugate base, it changes color to a different color. And so that's how indicators actually work. Uh, we'll, we'll say in general that an indicator's weak acid, we'll call HIN for indicator, IN for indicator, HIN, and it has an equilibrium with H plus and IN minus, which is the base form of the indicator. So they're both the indicator. One is just the conjugate acid of the indicator, which is one color, and IN minus is the conjugate base of the indicator. Now, if you look at how this equilibrium shifts at high and low pH, if you add acid to this uh, equilibrium, it shifts to the left, and you're going to get the acid color, HIN's color. If you add base, if you let's say we put hydroxide in the solution and the pH rises, hydroxide gobbles up H plus and turns it into water, so the H plus ion's concentration goes down, which shifts the equilibrium to the right, which means the uh, acid color is going to become the base color. And so that's how indicators actually work. The phenolphthalein that we use for titrating, um, it has a colorless molecule for its acid form, and then a purple color for its base color. This is actually phenolphthalein structure.
It's got uh, three benzene rings in it, and it's got this uh, um, molecule. But when it becomes, uh, when it's uh, mixed with a base, and it becomes the base color, it becomes pink. And so there's a slight difference in the molecule when it becomes the base color. Let's look at a different indicator, bromothymol blue. Each indicator doesn't always, indicators don't always change color at seven. They're gonna change color based on the weak acid, indica the indicator's a weak acid, remember, based on that indicator's Ka. Now, um, so I don't wanna, I don't want you thinking indicators always change color at seven, but I am gonna use an example which does change color at seven. And the example is bromothymol blue. Bromothymol blue um, is actually the perfect indicator if you want to know if something is acid or base because it is yellow in an acid and blue in a base and green at pH 7. So let's see how that works. Um, the HIN molecule for bromothymol blue is yellow. The conjugate base form of bromothymol blue is blue. Now pH equals pKa plus log of IN minus over HIN. The pKa, or the negative log of Ka for bromothymol blue is seven. So if you have equal amounts of the blue IN minus ion and the yellow HIN molecule, then you'll have seven plus the log of one, which is zero, you have a pH of seven. So when you have equal amounts of IN minus an HIN at a pH of seven, you have the green color. However, if you add acid, you're gonna have more HIN than IN minus, and you're gonna have the yellow color. So below a pH of seven, you have the yellow color, and above a pH of seven, you have the blue color. So that's actually how bromothymol blue, now it's a small amount of this weak acid, it's not enough to affect the chemistry of the solution, you know, it's just like, thousandths or ten thousandths or hundred thousandths of a mole of these chemicals so they're not really a they the indicator doesn't affect the pH the indicator gauges the pH it's this little equilibrium of the indicator molecule that's going to gauge the pH so when does an indicator change color when you get to the pKa of the indicator when the pH equals a pKa expect the color to, to be transitioning from one color to another. Here's a, a chart that shows many different indicators and their color changes. Might be interesting to look at phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein doesn't actually change until a pH of 9 or 8, uh, yeah that's a 9. pH of 9. It goes from colorless to faint pink around 8 to 9 and then it's becoming pink by 9 and 10. So colorless at an acid and pink in a base, but actually you can be seven and a half or eight even for the pH and you won't see any pink. You only see it when it gets above eight, around eight or nine. Um, here's bromothymol blue, which does change at seven, but you can have indicators changing like Cressel red all the way down at one or bromphenol blue changing at four. Just thought it was interesting here. A uh, few of these, Cressel Red, Cressel Thalein, and Cressel Purple, and Thymol Blue, actually have two colors, um, two cha color changes. This one's happening at one, and this one's happening at eight. This one's happening at two, and this one's happening at eight. Um, that's actually because they're not only weak acids, they are diprotic weak acids, which means they have two Ka values, which means they have two pKa's, or two color transitions. Um, so you can actually have an indicator that will change color twice on you. Crustle red will be red up to a pH of um, between one and two, convert to yellow, and then up around seven or eight, convert back to red. So it's um, uh, losing one proton at one and then losing another proton at eight. pH equals pKa, pKa one and pKa two. Universal indicator is actually a combination, I believe, of methyl red, which changes from red to yellow at around five. Um, bromothymol blue, which goes from yellow to green, 
and then um, uh, phenolphthalein. If you mix phenolphthalein with bromothymol blue and methyl red, you will actually get a mixture of indicators that will give you the entire rainbow of colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, from a pH of 0 to 14. So that's um, a really cool um, invention somebody came up with was mixing uh, three indicators together to give the rainbow um, as a way of um, monitoring the pH of a solution. So you can see that putting these indicators in, can you can get um, the, the uh, color changes to indicate when you uh, transition from one pH to another. So then, how do we choose an, an acid-base indicator? You might have wondered, why did Mr. Coker have us use phenolphthalein um, instead of bro uh, bromothymol blue because phenolphthalein doesn't change color at 7. Well, if you think about what we were titrating, we were titrating a strong acid and a strong base. And strong acid, strong bases have this really tall vertical portion. And I knew that phenolphthalein would catch right on that vertical portion. We would still see the color change. So the color change would still indicate when you had added the proper milliliters of acid because anywhere on the vertical portion of the graph, as long as your indicator changes color there, you're okay. We could have used methyl red because methyl red's color change occurs at this vertical part of the graph for a strong acid, strong base. Phenolphthalein works. Bromothymol blue would have worked because it changes color at seven. Anywhere from say four to 10 would be um, an indicator uh, color transition pH that would have been um, capable of changing color at the right time for our strong acid, strong base. But let me caution you, you start doing weak acids and strong base, you got to watch that because phenolphthalein would be an excellent indicator for a weak acid, strong base, but not methyl red. If you started trying to titrate a weak acid with a strong base, you would actually see the color change for methyl red in a portion of the graph that it does not correspond to the vertical part. So you always got to make sure your indicator color change matches the pH that you want for your equivalence point. So if you kind of know where is my inflection point going to be on my graph and then find a, P, a pKa for an indicator that matches that. Okay, and let's finish up with titrating polyprotic acids. Polyprotic acids are going to neutralize one proton at a time. Um, if you add OH- to H3PO4, the first reaction you're going to get, and once again it's going to go to completion, is going to be water and dihydrogen phosphate. When all of the H3PO4 has been used up, then the OH- will start reacting with the H2PO4- and make water and uh, monohydrogen phosphate. Then when all of the H2PO4 is used up, then the HPO4 will neutralize the OH-. Now to think about what the titration curve or pH graph might look at like there, um, when you are at the point in the titration where you have no base added, you're going to determine the pH by the pH of the pure acid, which will be based on the first ionization of, of um, the triprotic acid. When, you've, um, when you're not quite to the first equivalence point, you're going to have a buffer of the H3A and H2A minus. You could get the pH using um, pKa1 and pKa1 plus log of base over acid, henderson hasselbach At the first equivalence point, you have the conjugate base H2A minus, or maybe it's actually H2A minus the acid. So your pH is going to be determined by what would be the pH of H2A minus. Between the first and second equivalence point, it's what's the pH of a mixture of H2A minus and HA2 minus. At the second equivalence point, it's what's the pH of HA2 minus. Between the second and third equivalence points, it's what's the pH of HA2 minus mixed with A2 minus. At the third equivalence point, it's what's the pH of the base A2 minus. And then beyond the uh, equivalence point, it's what's the pH of the extra OH minus you've added. So you were actually going to get multiple stair steps. Now, if we had a strong enough or concentrated enough base, we would actually see a third 
um, equivalence point on this, we would see instead of two steps, a three step process here. But in fact, because of the Ka3 being uh, so small, we don't get to see it on the graph. But if you look at this, um, the initial point on the graph on the left, the pH below 2, that's the pH of pure phosphoric acid. When you are halfway to point B at point A, which is half equivalence point for the first H, you've got a mixture of phosphoric acid and dihydrogen phosphate. Your pH at that point should be pKa1. Or in other words, as your phosphoric acid comes down and your H2, if you look on the graph on the left, when your H2PO4 minus comes up and they meet um, in the middle at a 50-50 mixture, your pH should equal pK1. pH equals pK plus log of base over acid, equal amounts of conjugate base H2PO4 minus and H3PO4 means pH equals pK1. Then you're going to maximize out and all of your H2PO4 is going to convert to the H2PO4 minus. And that's going to be at point B, pH determined by H2PO4 minus. Notice it's still below 7 because it's you still have a double acid available in solution. Then you're going to start neutralizing that H2PO4 minus to make HPO4 minus 2. And somewhere around a pH of 7, you're going to be uh, 7.21. In fact, you're going to be equaling pK2 or that's point C on the graph, where equal amounts of H2PO4 minus and HPO4 minus 2 um, are making a buffer. Then it's going to rise to about a pH of 10 because you're going to have HPO4 minus 2, which is actually better a better conjugate base than it is an acid. And then again, you're going to get pK3 being halfway to the third equivalence point. So, um, kind of cool how you can do this. In fact, if you just wanted to kind of sketch the graph, you could calculate from an ice table the first pH at the initial at zero milliliters added. And then your first um, half equivalence point would be pK1. Your second half equivalence point could be plotted by calculating pK2. Your um, first equivalence point would actually be the average of pK1 and pK2. That's kind of cool. Um, you can just uh, do some quick negative logs of Ka's, and you would get all of the important points on the graph. Uh, the first buffering point, the first equivalence point, the second buffering point, the second equivalence point, the third buffering point, and so forth. Of course, realize that you're going to level out at a pH equal to the, uh, the asymptote for pH is going to be the pH of the pure base. Okay, so I'm going to post this video and these problems to do from chapter 15. So I thank you for your attention and I'll get this posted soon.